Um, I think the biggest problem is accessibility, but what's the, the environment? Um, the biggest thing is the labs. Sometimes I, I feel like they're hard to get through um, to the chairs and everything, and I feel like how the lab's set up isn't for people with uh, different abilities. Um, my different ability, I use a wheelchair to accommodate me. Everyone uses um, something to accommodate me, so we all use a vehicle to get here as accommodation, but it's so common that we don't see it as that. But I, I, mean, I have different um, ability in getting me from point A to point B. Um, the whole building, I mean, um, it takes me a while to get around, and also that in, inside the classrooms, it's hard for me. I'm always in the back room. Um, I always think they're really accommodating me by getting my paper and doing the work for me um, when it's lab where I have to write something on the board. Um, it's just, I, I'm looked at as a person that's disabled, which is with that implies it's like a non functioning person. That's like a dead body. Uh, I have a different ability. It's, the room is not um, wasn't designed for me. I'm just sitting in the back, right by the door, instead of trying to get food into the table. And um, that's what I experienced a lot here. And I was kind of used to it. Well, it was just it was just frustrating all the time. I just tried to like suppress it. Um, and my other friend, he told me he's a wheelchair. Said that I shouldn't be doing that. He, what he does as an active um, um, person with disability activist, um, he sits in the center in the classroom. And so it's not him, it's what everybody, you think this is the best design, it's not. Um, it's it's um, discriminating, um, discriminating people that are wheelchair users or with other abilities. So I think that was a, some of the, um, there's some classes that instructors do um, move the chairs and tables around. Um, it doesn't take that um, long, like less than a minute, just to, um, just to push some chairs around so I can get through and I can get involved in the classroom. Some um, don't think that I need to. It's like, you can just sit right there and just hand us the paper. And that's when I feel like I'm more limited, too. Um, this is not the way um, the room has to be designed for. It can be designed to you know, move around, take some like, chairs out, because not everyone uses all those chairs, there's always extras, you know, stacked up. So that's one thing I didn't notice that on, even at WCU, they had that problem too, um, of the working environment. But there are instructors that do um, make things easier for me. Have you had a chance to uh, have a lab over at Columbia Tech Center? No, I haven't. I was just wondering how that would work out for you. Yeah, I haven't. I don't. I haven't seen it either. No. Yeah, they have labs up on the second, uh, second floor. Do you guys have to answer the question? Yeah. Um. So I think a lot of the. A lot of the faculty and staff try to be like, accepting and respectful to diversity, but a lot of times they don't know how. And I feel like they need to be trained better sometimes towards towards students, and it just needs to be like taught more often. Like not many people really know what to do. Like. Like for Veronica, I mean, it's really simple for someone that knows, hey, just ask pronouns today or anything like that. Just simply ask and be kind and be respectful. But a lot of times people are like, what are you? Like, are you a boy or a girl? Like, stuff like that really hurts. Like, I used to get that when I was a kid sometimes because I had my hair that was really long and like, I would always hang out with girls and like, some kids would be like, are you a boy or a girl? I'm like, I'm a boy, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? And then, but I guess not sometimes, but <laughs> um, it's just it's just simple things that need to be learned for a lot of faculty and staff and the students in general. Just, <laughs> it, it would help a lot. 
question. So Frankie, I mean, is this what, what you're talking about, this kind of setting here, or are you thinking of something different? Well, this would be a good start. If like if a lot more people came, that would be really good. <laughs> and to say that, you know, when I schedule for a class that's coming up, uh, I'm expecting for my teacher to be white. That's kind of uh, depressing for me. Why do I have to expect for my teacher to be white? Why can't I have somebody to relate with? Um, we brought up the situation earlier about the lack of, or the 12% 12, 12 of uh, faculty and staff that are of color. And I, to be honest, I haven't even saw that. I don't, Professor, I saw that was of color is police, and um, it's, it's it's sad because I really would like to have somebody who I can just see, you know. And it's not even about me, but it's about all the other people who are of different nationalities and ethnicities. It's not. It's, I don't feel like it's right for the people of power to only be in power. I mean, I think it's a fair opportunity for all students if you're going to open up a a school for all ethnicities, then why not hire faculty and staff that are, or we have staff that are different ones, but professors, especially. Those are the people who I would like to see leading a class, and I don't know what that would take, but I'm ready for it, and if you guys want to give me the baseball bat, I'm ready, I'm ready to hit it. So, um, I just don't feel comfortable at all. I never really do, um, but that's just me. I understand what you're saying, and there's a lot of validity to it. I, I'm i wondering, and maybe for you in India? Inba. Inba, sorry. Uh, if going to a different country, if, say, one of the places I want to go is Italy. I just, I want to see where my grandfather was born and raised. And for me, if I wanted to spend any length of time there, I would expect governments run a little bit different, that the people I would come in contact with are a little bit different. Um, I would I guess, expect to be a minority in, in being Caucasian. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if what realistic expectations um, and I understand wanting to, to be around like people and to be accepted for who you are. And I mean, I think I stand out being just female in a very mechanical world. Um, <laughs> one of the very few. And then being tall and heavy and all that. I think we all have our, our own things that make us unique. So you would expect to be different but yeah. yet you would not expect to be minimized for being different. No, I would not want to be like excited to go to Italy if mm -hmm. you knew that, oh, if you would be there, people would be pointing at you because you mm -hmm. were different. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I guess you raised an issue over here, would you like to say something? <laughs> <laughs> but also, it's um, only, it, it's the assumption too, I think where um, most of the panel are, are United States, live in the United States, born in the United States. Okay. But they're seen as you're what you're looking like, mm -hmm. you're what, what you represent, who you represent is another place and not here. And that's the feeling that um, unintentionally that, that is given with, mm -hmm. with that because it's, well, you're in the United States, majority dominant culture is white, so mm -hmm. that's what's going to be here where mm -hmm. it takes away, well, you don't belong. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know that that's, that's an and impact. And I, I thank you for saying that. And I, I do want to make sure that each of you know that if we all look the same, this world would be boring as hell. So I, I appreciate the diversity. And yeah. One thing, thank you for <laughs> saying um, Or like being white, honestly, like I can just speak in Northern Mexico. Mm -hmm. If you're white, 
you're, you, you, I know you say you're expecting this, you know, to be the minority, to be the same, but you are white, you are from the USA. Everybody uses the USA as a power. You're gonna go to Mexico, people are gonna see you differently and not minimize you, but they're gonna be like, wow, this person has money, this person has wealth, they're from freedom, they're from this. That's why we have to, we wanna have this expectation, we wanna see more of this, mm -hmm. because like I said, if you go to Mexico, the, you know, there's gonna be those people who are like, oh, this, you know, Word is gringo, they're going to be like, you know, there's that word. But they come to your face and they're going to offer you so many things because of what they want your money, they want your power, they want your, your freedom, they want a, a smidge of it. So even if you were to go to Italy, you're still in power in some sense. There's levels of power and privilege within and that, especially like he's right, you know, uh, when I go to Mexico, I'm light skinned and I'm treated completely different. Oh, I love going to Mexico. Well, and it's in other countries too. Mm -hmm. As soon as I, and the, the power and privilege keeps building up. As soon mm -hmm. as I say a U.S. citizen, as soon as this, as soon as that, there's a lot of power and privilege being a U.S. citizen, even in, not just in this country, mm -hmm. but other countries as mm -hmm. well. And so um, th there's that, that even worldly, mm -hmm. there is that level of power and privilege that I don't think people that live in the United States really, really comprehend and understand until they go outside of that and mm -hmm. realize you know, the light complexion and what that really means and, and the, the privilege and status of being a citizen and uh, money and classism and all that stuff does play a big part. And it is, I think, even more seen and more in your face in other countries than it is in here because it's a quiet thing. We don't want to talk about race, right? Or this room would be filled. We don't want to talk about classism. We don't want to talk about sexism. We don't want to talk about this. And hearing what they have to say, it's still like, Okay, that's their experience, but we're not equating it to this is their a lot of people's experience here. And that seeing people like us in the room might change that because they can have those conversations at the diversity center because they see me and then I open that space up and they feel safe having that. The person that's white comes in that room, they don't feel safe. So to be in that until they are proven, they prove themselves and become an ally to them, that's when that, that whole conversation comes in with them. And that's different. And then, but when they're in the classroom and they don't see somebody, a teacher or other people look that look like them, they're always, they're like, how am I going to be, how am I going to succeed? But there's a lot of different factors involved in that. And a lot of times it's just for the institution, I'm not just talking about Clark, it's the institution to find that money, to realize that they're going to get a different population if they bring more ugly stuff that look like different, that talk about these issues. There's going to be a difference in there. Dina. Um, well, I'm going to share a little story, <laughs> just a real quick one. I've always been an advocate for people that are different. I'm going to try really hard to say this correctly, okay? Um, I was a truck driver. I went to Montgomery, Alabama, went into a truck stop, and myself and two other truck drivers were the only white people there, and we couldn't get waited on. And I walked out of there, and I felt horrible. I cannot, and I cannot imagine living that way every day. And it does give me a new respect that we, we've kind of talked about this before. Um, and sometimes I think if we put ourselves in other people's, I don't want to say shoes, but situations, um, I had a teacher here who, if she was female, and she would only call on the men. Several of us women had our hands up, and we were like, why? Um, she was rude to me, and I told her straight up, you need to stop that now. You need, we had a person in the class who was handicapped. She did not know how to deal with him, and she was rude. So, I think if we just put ourselves in the situation, maybe look at it with different eyes and be open to looking at it with different eyes. That might be a, a good help. There's a question over here. Sorry. Oh, sorry. What, oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I, I, you asked a question earlier about expectations and what, or what mm -hmm. expectations people should have. And, and I think considering the demographics of this country, of this region, of this area, it's perfectly reasonable that these students would have expectations that they would see faculty and staff more like them, which is perfectly reasonable. Um, within this region, we are around 24% uh, people of color. The student body of this institution is around 26% students of color. We have a faculty and staff that is 12% and it's pitiful. It's pitiful. 
So um, the idea that these students should have to adjust their expectations seems a little problematic to me because um, that is not necessarily, we should be striving for better and more <laughs> rather than forcing these students to expect less. Um, especially considering the demographics of our, our region and our country are changing. You know, for a lot of time, by the year 2020, we were looking like we were going to be a majority minority in the United States. Um, and then they changed the census and now it's 2040. But we're still at a place where there are going to be more brown people than white people in this country in a very near future. And the idea that we can't even get it together to find qualified faculty and staff to serve this institution and to serve the students whose demographics are changing, mm -hmm. very, very problematic. I, know. I agree, and I want to expand on something that you had mentioned also as far as being able to put ourselves in another person's position in that I went to a restaurant, and it's a very well-known restaurant with a Hispanic friend, and they wouldn't wait on us, and it, I think it was 30 minutes, and we finally got up and left. I will never go back to that restaurant again. And I understand that this was a glimpse of something that he had to deal with every day of his life. And I only got a very small glimpse of it. Um, why did I bring that up? Actually, you know, that's a good example of how to use your power and privilege. Mm -hmm. You're not going to ever be a person of color, mm -hmm. right? And we're not advocating that everybody becomes a, a person of color. That's mm -hmm. what's going to make our better. That's not what it is. Mm -hmm. It's how to use your power and privilege. So being a, a, a power, understanding that power and privilege is that you go up and speak on behalf and say, you know what, I was here with this Latino, my Latino friend. Mm -hmm. I noticed I didn't get weighed on. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling it's because um, I'm, I'm with someone that's Latino because that's what it feels like to me. Mm -hmm. And you should know that this is a bad practice and that is not okay. Mm -hmm. And I will not attend anymore. Because mm -hmm. that's using your power and privilege instead of going, oh, that sucks for you. Mm -hmm. Let's not go again. But that's how to utilize your power and privilege to, mm -hmm. to really stand up for that social justice. But mm -hmm. also, because we're not asking that it only be targets or only be agents. It's mm -hmm. how to use that, mm -hmm. how to navigate this. So it's not just about them and us. It's how do we. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of us are very uh, integrated, uh, married to or have children. I have a grandchild who's Latino and a grandchild who's not only black but blind. Um, and so it's really useful for me to be here and hear this and figure out how to help these children navigate these things. You know? I'm white, white, white. So I really appreciate you sharing and being honest about what's going down for you. Because that helps me. One of um, the things that I would like to ask is to really, really be open-minded. Because I know you didn't make me to, uh, you know, use your uh, example as uh, on purpose, but like to, for us, for example, in my, uh, I was in the panel for women's studies class, for the queer panel, and I was explaining to them how, like Keith says, you get stared at daily, and you eventually, you know, you kind of just either deal with it, or you, you'll see it every single, you know, in every single face. Um, and when I was telling them, I get, I use the word, the term clock, because it's, uh, the term's clock, uh, I would just use it when you get kind of like found out you're, you're gay or you're, I'm, you know, I'm Veronica, but then they feel like, oh, that's a boy. You, we use the term clock. Okay. And um, so I was explaining this to this to the, to the, man, or to the students. After the class, the student came up, you know, well, don't think about it like that all the time, because I know there's some people that might be thinking, wow, those are some fabulous shoes. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but 99% of the time, it's because they're trying to figure out whether I have male or female genitalia, whether I'm going to transition. Do I like guys or girls? So, you know, for me, 99% of the time is that. I know there's that very few chances when it's like, oh, you know, pretty hair or whatever, but it's over here. So um, sometimes it's kind of like hard to, it's like, that's what I mean by saying you're being open minded. It's like almost like don't try to defend yourself. And be like, oh, but I have this friend. Well, you're now you're being, now you're token. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I mean by like, just kind of be open-minded. 